Welcome to Love What You Love. I'm Julie Rose. I'm insatiably curious about people in the world around us and absolutely in love with passion and unselfconscious enthusiasm. Every other week, I geek out with someone about the thing that they love and then I share it with you. Welcome back or welcome. The weather has just been stupid nice around here. There's just something about getting out in the sunshine, seeing how many different shades of purple there are in the flowers festooning the yards in your neighborhood or nearby park, hearing scores of different bird songs in just one block, feeling the breeze on your face. It doesn't heal the wrongs of the world, that's for sure, but it does put some courage back in your heart. I think we're all needing some of that healing lately. Speaking of the healing power of nature, let's meet this week's guest. He's an expert in and advocate for cannabis, and just a super, super nice dude. Zach has worked in the medical cannabis industry for many years, and is a passionate advocate for cannabis in all its forms. A few years ago, he started a Twitch channel called PotQuest, which aims to promote cannabis culture and provide insight, education, and community. In this chat, we talk the difference between CBD and THC, Etsy the Iceman, who can use medical cannabis, the rise of cannabis culture, cannabis and community, and so much more. So find out why Zach loves cannabis and why you might learn to love it too. Hey Zach, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Julie. You've got a channel on Twitch called PotQuest. You've been doing it for about three years, and the intention is to introduce folks to cannabis culture beyond, quote, getting high and playing video games, unquote. So what is cannabis culture? Can you explain that for us? Cannabis culture, oh, it's it's vast, I believe, um, mostly revolving around everyone's appreciation of the plant and how it uh, impacts us directly, indirectly. A lot of us look towards um, the hippie era and getting together, rolling a joint, smoking and changing the vibe and stuff. But it's um, grown immensely into to much more like I'm part of the medical cannabis culture and uh, what we do with self-sufficiency and gardening, uh, making your own medicine. And that's that's only a fraction of what's out there in regards, you know. There's there's been so many new highlights as the legalities have changed for cannabis. Mm. You know, we're starting to see more um, out there online, folks sharing their own experiences, not just with uh, cannabis with medicine, but like highlighting the the cultivation, all of these new gadgets and stuff that we're using to partake in the cannabis and the different ways that you can partake in it and stuff. So cannabis culture is uh, it's it's not just the experience of you know, the experience of the THC or whatever, but it's, there's more around it. Can you talk a little bit more about like, what, what is kind of under the umbrella of cannabis culture? With, with the, the legal uh, cannabis that's coming out. And that's the part that I'm a part of, like grow, growing up myself, I've always been around uh, legal cannabis mm -hmm. and uh, the folks that are my mentors, like my mentor himself is somebody that would be considered a legacy grower, someone who's been involved with cannabis before the legalities and stuff and seeing that culture that was present before it was openly embraced by like mainstream um society um like he's uh 64 uh he had witnessed the hippie era and it's it's just amazing to connect with him and many others online and hear their experiences of what it was like before we had really opened the doors for everyone to explore this as we do now so how many states in the United States is cannabis legal right now, um, Ooh, either from recreational or medical? Um, there are over, I believe, 11 to 13 that are uh, recreational and over 30 that have some form of medical cannabis. And it's it's still ever changing. I think New York is the latest that's happening right now. It looks like it's within a week they're looking to pass recreational cannabis. So. Now, what is what is tipped? The balance here, you know, what, I mean, when I was growing up, it was like, ooh, pot, you know, ooh, it's whatever, gateway drug. And then suddenly, you know, however many years later, it's like free and available, not free, but it's available um, for people in lots of states just to smoke or take however they want. So what was the tipping point? Oh, goodness. I believe somewhere around like uh, when we started looking at medical cannabis again, mm -hmm. um, 
it was pretty interesting to see like you know in in the states um we had uh cannabis uh in the in in our past the colonies had introduced it the um the king at the time that was bringing the colonies over wanted everybody to produce hemp and um it was something that was um becoming a staple for the society then and as soon as we separated from um England and it became our own colonies and started developing as a country somewhere down the line um it became a commercialized um product for like uh fabric and stuff and um once it started to teeter towards becoming something that was sustainable like it started to uh compare to uh the fuels that we were using for for vehicles in the 1900s and stuff like uh they were going to start using them to to create biofuels uh, huh? and uh so there was this point where once it reached that that level like totally like capitalism and everything like cracked down they started uh changing the infrastructure making things illegal again the reefer bandits era came about and that's something that's still prevalent to this day like even even people around me still have this idea like oh um smoking's bad and it's going to lead to bad decisions and stuff <laughs> and um it was it was um it was, it was pretty interesting um Ca yeah california was actually one of the first um uh, states after after all of that where it was like part of the hemp industry and legal in the early 1900s they were the first to make it illegal and then make it legal again once they looked at it from the medical perspective in the 90s 96 i seem to recall reading somewhere that marijuana was put on the it was like a government list of of illegal drugs but there was like a controversy behind marijuana being even on that list at all yeah there really was no major indication as to why that was put on there i think it was really looking back at it is totally um something that was geared towards like i was saying it was like they were trying to put a veil over the fact that it was something that was becoming positive and beneficial and they demonized it essentially there was there was that uh reefer madness era was was coming about when they decided to put together nixon's controlled substance act forgive my ignorance but hemp is it the same plant as as marijuana cannabis how yep. what if, yeah oh it is mm -hmm. hemp is a derivative of cannabis there's a couple of different kinds of cannabis um hemp is just a form of cannabis that's a high producer of cbd cannabidol oh now the uh colonists brought it over were they using it strictly for the hemp or were they also smoking it um it was something that was um I was trying to look into that. They they were using it for smoking, but it was mostly used um for the production of like paper and fibers and um it was interesting cuz they were actually um given the opportunity in some places like Virginia and Massachusetts, I believe, to use that hemp to pay taxes. And they they probably were taking the time to just partake, but yeah. Interesting. So now what's the right terminology? And and what kind of stigma is attached to some of these words? So, like, is it cannabis? Is it weed? Is it oh. marijuana? Is it pot? Like, is there a preferred terminology? Um, It's really up in the air, you know. I think myself and a lot of our, our friends that are uh, regular users, it's, it's a matter of, like, intent, you know. Like, I see myself calling it pot, weed, cannabis all the time. I call it cannabis a lot when I talk about it to friends to enlighten them on, on scientific terminology and whatnot. And um, yeah, it's, it's just more so just whatever's clever. Let's kind of step back and find out when did you start getting interested in it? Kind of what was what's your origin story? Oh my, yeah. Um, my parents told me when I was young that if I were to do drugs and alcohol uh, as a minor, it would totally uh, affect me later in life. And so I didn't even bother with it until uh, I was nineteen um, in my own home and. My my younger brother, 18 at the time, wanted to come over and chief it with my friends. And they were like, here, come on, try it out, you know. And, uh, yeah, I got to got to smoke it for the first time. And I actually, I actually ended up uh, taking too big of a hit, uh -oh. coughing and throwing up and stuff. <laughs> oh, no. And it was just, like, so bad. I, I tell that story to my friends all the time. And it was, it was a very interesting sensation, definitely a, a changer, and dabbled with it here and there. Um, eventually, I... Uh, met with more folks in our community that were actually gardening and using it for medical benefit. And 
uh, from there, we started to work with people in our community to just learn more about the plant. Got it. Got it. And when you say your community, is that like a cultural community or where you live or both? Uh, where I live. Yeah. Um, uh, over here, I'm in a small town in Riverside County, and uh, it's more tight knit because we've just been a smaller populace for so long. And there were a few of our elders, like my friend's uncle was totally a dude growing a bunch in his backyard. <laughs> so eventually we just saw it and he was like asking for help. So it just, you know, it became one of those things, helping out a friend's. You worked for seven years for a licensed medical co-op. So how did you, you know, how did you go from smoking a little weed in your apartment or house, helping out some elders in the community to actually working in the medical uh, cannabis community? Oh, my. Uh, it ended up being just just a random interaction between my neighbor and I. I had, I had um, moved into a new community and I had um, met my neighbor and had seen what he had been putting together. This this gentleman had been operating this co-op and the main facility essentially on his own with a few folks that would come in here and there and try and assist him. And as I began to hang out with him more and, and take it in, I, I had asked if, if he had needed assistance with some of that stuff and just moved from there. In 2013, he had actually experienced a, a car accident and was incapacitated. And there was very, very few people that were willing to come up and help him with his cannabis project. At the time, he actually had uh, a major uh, garden that was in the middle of harvest. So he just had a bunch just sitting there. So um, from that point on, I just stepped up and just just took the lead. And so you did that for seven years. So what were you doing? What was your role uh, as part of this co-op? My my major role is uh, the the propagation vegetative cycle specialist, as as I describe it to people. I had uh, started plants for other people. My my role was to uh, take care of this room that we call a veg room, mother room, in which we would host plants that were growing perpetually in the vegetative cycle which is more focused on like the green growth, stalk, stems, leaves, versus the flowering growth, um, which finishes the plant. And um, so a majority of my time was spent producing anywhere from a few hundred clones a week to, to like 500 for the rest of our co-op, where other members were, they were also licensed medical cultivators. Um, they would sponsor us providing the supplies uh, to continue the grow. And in return for that, we would give them the plant starts that were grown in the vegetative cycle so that they could finish them in the flower cycle. So for, for these folks that are uh, sponsoring our co-op, um, they would receive this plant start that was already partially grown through one stage. So it's a shorter grow cycle for them. The flowers is, is the part that people ingest as medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Got it. Got it. And how easy is it to propagate? I mean, are they pretty easy to grow plants? Honestly, I always tell folks it's easy to grow, but it is it's different when you want it to grow how you want it. To grow, <laughs> you <know? laughs> sure. Sure. So, what do you mean by how you want it? Like, how? What? What's the difference? Um, there, there are a lot of folks that strive to manipulate the growth so that they can get the most flower out, out of the plant as they can. So yeah, they just try and do things so that they can make sure the plant gets enough light or if they're giving it the appropriate amount of food so that, that they could essentially, um, uh, increase yield of trichomes. The, the trichomes are, uh, produced from the plant. The, the trichomes are actually something that's produced by many plants to protect them from the UV rays of the sun. And uh, the cannabis trichomes produce the cannabinoids and stuff that are um, getting us high. So what is the difference between CBD and THC? Oh, OK. So uh, cannabidiol uh, CBD does not have the same psychoactive properties as THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, so you're going to get more of the relaxation. Um, you're actually not going to have that that heady high or any of that. It's it's more so something that they've they've shown it to to help battle inflammation, anxiety, muscle aches, and all that kind of thing. It doesn't actually give you that other effect like the THC does. Got it. And so then you can propagate plants for those particular qualities. The hemp plant essentially is um, the cannabis plant that has been bred with its uh, 
bred with itself so much in, in, in an incestuous way that it, it pretty much has eliminated the production of THC itself. Oh, so if you're getting like a CBD oil or whatever, it's most likely created from a hemp plant? Yep. Uh, there will be, um, yeah, they talk about that as industrial hemp. Industrial hemp will, will guaranteed have less than 0.03 THC. What are all the different ways you can get cannabis and what kind of trends are you seeing? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, there are so many manners in which you could intake the cannabis these days. Yeah, that starts with the uh, combustion of flour. Then there's vaporizing the flour as well. Instead of using fire, you would, you would use a heating element to, to pretty much bake it and inhale the vapor. There's also the concentrates made by the flour, topicals, tinctures, salves, um, edibles, which all, uh, some of those could be taken externally or orally. Um, I've seen some sprays and and stuff like um, I have uh, also seen transdermal patches. I've uh, purchased uh, industrial hemp transdermal patch and I used it while I was flying from Maine back to California. And that was like such a relief for the long flight. You know, some like that definitely recommend. You know, with any explosion of an industry, there's there's some good producers and some mm -hmm. not so good producers. So. Should people go straight to their local co-op or can you trust online things? Like, how would you direct consumers? It, I would definitely look to the um, companies that provide the most information. Transparency is mm. key. Um, and with the products, um, there there's a lot that's going on that is behind the veil. Um, there are some mainline companies that will provide cannabis and like all you'll get out of it is the strain name how much is there um what we were we were just uh going on about the trends um the the trend that i've been following and that's been a major one as of late is the cannabis concentrates and it's been evolving since uh legalization and given more time people have been trying to work with the plan different ways to improve yield improve their experiences by getting the most out of it and getting these concentrates has been a big thing like Hash itself is technically a concentrate of cannabis flower. You're taking the accumulative trichomes um, and partaking in that versus the uh, trichomes and the plant matter of the flower. Forgive me. I'm not sure I know what hash is. Can you explain what hash is? Hash is something that, that we've, we've totally acquired from the plant. Like, um, like for, for totally hundreds of years, people have been able to collect hash from the cannabis plant. It's like essentially like uh, there's temple hash buddhist temple hash from nepal uh is very popular um these buddhist monks would take the live plant and just strip it with their hand and the trichomes while they're fresh and sticky would accumulate on your hands like a waxy layer and so you would take that and rub it together and get get good old chunks of that and you you too could combust that and that's a higher concentrate of the trichomes the cannabinoids terpenoids flavonoids than partaking in the flower itself. This is probably, I hate to just throw this one at you, but like how long have humans been using cannabis? Oh gosh, thousands of years. Um, I think uh, one of one of the things I always point to is the the Iceman that they had found, you know, the the dude that lying, lying face down yeah. air on his back. He had cannabis on him. No, really? Yep. In what form? Was it like flowers or was it hash or what? Just, just flowers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about that the other day. It's very interesting. Um, the human body has the endocannabinoid system in it, like naturally. We are naturally um, supposed to be partaking in the cannabis and stuff. But it wasn't until recently, the last few hundred years, maybe thousand years, that we actually developed ways in which we could combust the flower or partake in it beyond just, you know, grazing the plant like a natural animal. Interesting. So so you're saying humans evolved along with cannabis and they've been eating the plant or whatever for yeah. a long time. Yeah. Fascinating. That's fascinating. So, and has it always been considered medicine or did people also consider it, you know, something fun to do? I think it was first used, um, like our first recorded um uses of it were for ritualistic purposes for ceremony so what is the difference in experience between 
like smoking versus tinctures versus is there like a you know is there like a, a practical effect and you know is there a different kind of cultural experience oh yeah definitely um i always tell people that our experience with cannabis is very unique it's personal um chemical makeup diet metabolism mental physical health exposure the manner in which you intake it the the cannabis itself is so unique like i was saying there's the cannabinoid content the terpenoid content flavonoids and um like we had just mentioned those two very popular ones thc CBD, there are tons of cannabinoids that are found within the plants as well. And the combinations of them give us different effects. They call it the entourage effect. When you are smoking the cannabis and you're consuming it orally, you're getting a totally different sensation. You're actually engaging different parts of your endocannabinoid system in your body. Like um, smoking it uh, goes through your system differently through the lungs and everything in the blood. Um, your body breaks down what you consume orally and there's bacteria in our gut that are interacting with that as well. And so, um, that alone is, is an indicator of different effects. Um, when you smoke it, um, it's near instantaneous and could last potentially up to an hour or so. And when you consume it orally, it takes a little bit of time for your body to break it down and metabolize, but it could last much longer up to like eight hours to a full day, potentially, depending on what you consume. And so there are there like designer combinations or strains that have been created for a specific, you know, I want to fight nausea or I, you know, so I take this kind or I want to feel that heady high, but I don't want to be whatever yep. tired. So there's different strains. Yep. There are totally different strains. Um, we, we have uh, looked at it uh, mostly as like, like a, we, we were calling it indica and sativa, and then there's hybrids. And like the, the indica um, strains were notorious for giving you a physical high, a body vibe, versus the sativas giving you the heady high and changing your clarity and thought and stuff like that. And the hybrids could have any sensation in between. And so there have been folks that have um, bred certain strains that could give you certain effects. And like I've seen things like... Uh, Indica with CBDs uh, in, involved, like 50-50 Indica CBD is what's been labeled on the bag. And um, it, it's also that, like I was saying about uh, the terpenoids, the terpenoids and the cannabinoids, the combination of those alone give you different sensations. And um, some of those terpenes also have those um, effects, sensations um, that would give you um, the high, if you will. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence about cannabis helping with certain medical conditions like nausea, things like that. Have there been like peer reviewed medical journal articles that investigate these more anecdotal claims? Um, not like not here. Um, unfortunately, yeah, like you were saying, like I, I was just telling that to people as well. It's like my own experience is anecdotal evidence compared to what what we accept through clinical trials and, and studies where there's a control. And we only have had a handful of them in the States. And like the only thing they looked at was the effects of uh, smoking cannabis flower versus tobacco. And the results were obvious about what, what happened with that. And um, we're looking to countries like Israel um, who are who are doing studies. And I'm sure that they have um, more clinical studies and documentation on like the benefits of cannabis and, and like that. Like there's a. The ICCI, International Cannabis Cannabinoid Institute, and they have a lot of uh, studying done in articles in regards to how we are affected by cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. The lack of that in the U.S. is just there's been such a stigma for so long. Mm -hmm. The legalities, they were telling me. Um, so essentially because cannabis, uh, marijuana THC is on the Schedule 1 uh, status of the Controlled Substance Act, we cannot do anything with it in regards to studying it medically. No clinical trials will be made until they bring it down to Schedule 3. I'm sure there's been a push over and over for it to come off of Schedule 1, but is there anything kind of concerted effort right now to do that? There was a bill that was presented, the Moore Act, um, last year, um, and they tried to bring it to, I think it was the, the House passed it, and um, they needed the 
other uh, governing entity to approve it, the Senate. And um, they, at the end of the year, they just, just not vote for it. And so they didn't bother voting on it at the end of the year. The bill got wiped. So they had to reintroduce a new one this year. So that's in the works. Fingers crossed. So taking it off of Schedule 1, do you think it would clear the way for other states to approve it recreationally? Absolutely. Like we say there's medical marijuana in 30 states, but the availability varies widely, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm I'm in California with medical cannabis since 96, and we still have what they call in the industry dry cities, where there is lack of availability of cannabis within a 60 mile radius. Tell me a little bit about your Twitch stream. So you started like three years ago. Were you on Twitch before or did you come onto Twitch specifically to do this stream? Um, I totally was a viewer. Um, before I streamed on Twitch, I was using Twitch as my entertainment while I was doing my cannabis work. I had I had been doing the harvesting and working with my friends and it was just something it was like, okay, it's either this or have Bob Marley blasting for twelve hours and <laughs> Oh gosh, it was really interesting to see. I had I had witnessed there, like um, you had mentioned, yeah, I, was, I had seen cannabis was was around on Twitch, but it was mostly people just hanging out, smoking, and being like leery about it as well. Like just like it was still something that was like walking on eggshells on the internet to be able to broadcast that for yourself. Your stream is about educating, and then you show you're actually cultivating you're actually doing your propagation work on stream right oh yes yeah over over the past few years i've just been sharing the entire process um I, there were days we'd just go into my bedroom and i would water the plants inspect them talk about their status we would we would take starts and um check in on my buddy and the rest of the gardens and and just talk about examples i've been um sharing my my example of diy and and that's been a major thing versus other folks um i've had great success in um sharing how it could be done without really relying on like going and buying expensive brand name products to to get it done how they say it should be done brand name products like growing materials or yeah like um like people are always saying like, oh, you need this light, it's the best light, or you need to be using this line of supplements, it's the best. And this it's just something that ends up being, you know, if there's if you just understand how it happens, like the science behind it, the the equipment doesn't matter. Did you have a background in botany at all before you started? No. Um, I'm totally just self starter. Um I while I started my work with the co-op um, at the same time, I was running uh, another facility. I was a general manager at this lavender farm in California that's organic. And um, so while while I was working there, um, they gave me the opportunity to take seminars. And uh, like my my big thing was was uh, learning about the soil and microbiology. And so I got a chance to uh, work with like master gardeners and a few that were learning about the soil food web. And so I got to go and, and play with the dirt over there. We actually like took the time to take soil samples and, and look at the microorganisms in the, in the soil samples and take notes and try and work with it to improve how we can grow our different things that we have there. Do you foresee yourself doing what you're doing now for a long time? Or do you see yourself doing other things in the botany world as well? I'm hoping to do more. Yeah, just in general. I love gardening. I have I have so much going on with, with the plant life. I'm just looking to improve my relations with nature. What have been the the benefits and the challenges of streaming what you stream on Twitch? I, I've really enjoyed the idea of having the the discussion live. Um there's there's always been hiccups in regards to what we do with uh, the discussion of cannabis culture, cultivation and stuff with, with folks that just kind of summarize things. And it's, it's been, an, it's been something where um, people share their experience solely versus taking in other people's experience as well. And um, when we opened the doors for, for the, the, the stream and started talking about our experience, there were other people that were wanting to connect and share their own and, it just blew up into uh, the whole community. Uh, there are a lot of people that I engage with that uh, 
that I look to 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 see their example as well as my own. Um, it's become a a thing where we're getting a lot more peer to peer review, and uh, that's been one benefit. The other problem is is that the conflict of interest. Um, I have so many people that are are willing to um, debate uh, things. They they want to be vague and demanding. Um, I get I get people that are like they see me in the middle of my work and they want to be like, oh, you should be doing it this way instead. And <laughs> and uh, it's just like okay, you know, you, you get that. Um, you know, you broadcast for an eight hour period, you can get that kind of commentary. So, so you brought. So, how how many days a week are you broadcasting? I'm essentially almost every day for eight hours a day. Yeah. Wow, that's some stamina. It's been nice to to get down. I do all sorts of things. Um, yeah, with, we do our gardening, and then I'm doing other types of engagement. Um, right now, I'm doing a couple charity fundraisers and selling beef jerky. In your experience with just cannabis in general. What has been the most surprising thing about your experience? The diversity. I, I think it was something that when everyone gets into it, we just have this very basic idea of cannabis. And um, as I've learned more about actually growing the plant and understanding it, like it's, it's a very complicated thing. Diversity in terms of how it can be used? Yep. Oh, oh, yeah. How it could be grown, used, um, how how people go about it with life. Like I'm always telling people I, I'm I'm extremely unbiased. I tell like there's more than one way to grow cannabis, process cannabis, intake cannabis. You know, there's so many ways you could consume it, smoke it. Who is using cannabis these days? Personally, working at, at my co-op and stuff, I have a bunch of friends that are retired law enforcement and folks that have been in government and there are some that are still working that are partaking in it and they are fully functioning socially acceptable human beings <laughs> um i myself you know um i get people that look at my cast and they glance at my work for a moment and they just see an image but they don't see the work behind what we do you know and that's a big one yeah, yeah. is there like a especially for medical cannabis, is there kind of a minimum age where it's good or useful? Like kids who are in chemotherapy, are they given cannabis? Can they be? I am I am all for medical cannabis for those in need and recreational cannabis for the responsible adults. Yeah. And um, I have seen positive benefits from, from cannabis use, even for... Um, terminally ill babies. The place where I go to get my med card um, renewed, the nurse there was always talking about it. She's like, oh, my favorite part of the job is making the IDs for the babies. <laughs> and, but, um, they do. They they extremely benefit from it. And uh, there's a Vice did a, a wonderful documentary on that with a few children that were partaking in it. And it's it's something where it's it's like I like I said, it's it's uh, stigmatized because everybody immediately goes to your child shouldn't be smoking. And it's not really that they're taking tinctures for, for medical benefit. And then some of it, like for, for some of those, they're doing like CBDs and like, you know, what we discussed earlier, it's something that is totally not, not affecting them. Like people perceive when they talk about cannabis. So are there some other misconceptions? I'm sure there are, but what are the other misconceptions about cannabis that absolutely drive you bonkers that you want to kind of bust? There's there's the idea of the anxiety weed. People people keep coming up to me and telling me like I have this anxiety weed. I smoke it and it gives me anxiety. And I tell them, I'm sorry, that's you. You <laughs> have a pre existing condition and <laughs> cannabis is a catalyst for your pre existing condition. Well, we were talking about the um the impact and, and cultural impact. I know people that have major anxiety smoking cannabis and it makes it worse when they smoke cannabis not because they were anxious before but because the idea of inebriating themselves on cannabis with that idea of like reefer madness in mind like it's bad their parents told them it was bad right. so so that is a major impact on their anxiety towards when they they smoke it and stuff and like the idea of being seen while partaking will give them anxiety versus anything else how about some other misconceptions that you hate? 
I'm always talking to folks in the international community and they want to speak to me about cannabis from legal places in California and compare it to their cannabis that they get uh, shipped overseas. And I have to tell them that the cannabis at the store, the companies that provide that cannabis are not smuggling cannabis overseas. So you're getting a, a fake product. And like they, the people internationally keep keep coming up to us and be like, well, I got this from California. It's like, honestly, it probably isn't from California. It could be from anywhere. Someone's listening who wants to get started with cannabis, either growing it or using it. And they're in a place where they can do that. Uh, where would you suggest that they start? Definitely the Internet. There's there's a few places like um, I always mention uh, Normal, ICCI. Um, just a few books, like looking at like what, what Ed Rosenthal has out there, the can of Bible marijuana growers handbook. Um, and, and like, just, just learning about plants in general, mm. you know, I have a lot of people that, that always talk about wanting to grow organically, naturally. And so like, we were like, Hey, well, check out teaming with microbes. You know, that's, that's a pretty good start. You know, if someone was like a beginner in terms of actually taking cannabis, is there like a, a strain or, you know, a particular type that you recommend to get started with that's kind of a like a an ease a way to ease in? I don't know. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's, it's that's always like it's it's like such a personal journey mm. thing, you know, because um, I've I've totally met people that I would spoke and and they would they would partake in something or it's like, oh, I cannot have a lot of this. It's extremely potent for me. Mm. And um so it's it's really hard. It's really hard to make that recommendation. I always tell tell people like, you know, like maybe do you want to smoke or or consume something and give recommendations for the type of cannabis to intake. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, all right, cool. So they should watch your Twitch stream and maybe send you a chat if they have a question. Oh, I'm I'm always about that. I I have folks I'm like, we could talk about it if you want to like get into the details. It's easier to like break it down. Well, Zach, thank you so much for taking so much time to talk with me today and, and educating me. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Julie. It was a really nice talk. I learned so much. Huge thanks to Zach for his time, his passion, and his expertise. You can find Zach at potquest.live, twitch.tv slash potquest, and as official potquest, O-F-F-P-Q, on Twitter. Of course, I'll include these links, as well as links to Zach's favorite nonprofits, in the show notes. Just a reminder that you can find this podcast on Instagram at lovewhatyoulovepod, on Twitter at whatyoulovepod, and the website is lovewhatyoulovepod.com. All of the transcripts for Love What You Love are available for everyone on the website, thanks to Emily White, transcription wizard and proprietress of The Wordery. If you need transcripts, reach out to her at emily at thewordery.com. The music for Love What You Love is called Inspiring Hope by Pink Sounds. A link to that artist is included in the show notes. As always, thank you so much for listening. Let's hang out again soon. There's some good in this world, Mr. Farrell. And it's worth fighting for.
There's some good in this world, Mr. Furl. And it's worth fighting for.